Hi class, it's Professor Adamson. I'm just gonna jump right in. I'm gonna try to keep this to a 30 minute lecture. We are gonna be talking about subjective and objective tests today, mostly about subjective tests. Before we do that, I wanna just distinguish between the two. I'm at a friend's house, so if, um, if something happens, just letting you know I'm sort of not in control of this. Um, I'm using his computer. So uh, subjective versus objective. A subjective test has a subject, right? So think of any behavioral sort of test where we uh, present a stimulus, uh, a tone, for example, a pure tone, and the person responds in kind as to whether or not they hear it. In other words, a subjective test has a person in it. It has a person's sort of opinion, a person's, um, I guess, sort of whatever they bring to the table, whatever maybe um, grumpiness they have going on that day, anything that the person's dealing with, a person maybe wanting to fake a hearing loss, for example. Subjective tests are behavioral tests. We are presenting information and then observing how the person responds behaviorally, okay? Objective tests, on the other hand, don't take that person's uh, response um, behaviorally into consideration. In other words, it sort of removes the person from the equation. It's sort of like reflexes. I put information into the ear and then I look at the equipment to see how the body responds. Not how the person responds, but how the body is responding, okay? Now, we as audiologists have a whole battery, a whole array of both objective and subjective tests that we can use at our disposal. But as you might guess, most of the subjective tests that we use are for adults, well, co normally cognitively functioning adults, adults of, um, you know, high IQ, or relatively high IQ. I mean, it doesn't have to be a high IQ, but um, people who are not developmentally disabled or cognitively delayed. Um, we can also do them on older children. Pretty much any child above, you know, kindergarten age or so, we can do subjective tests on. Objective tests, on the other hand, we have to do on babies. We have to do on very, very young children, like early early childhood toddlers, and also the developmentally disabled adults, okay? Because, you know, as you might guess, babies, um, people who are severely MRDD are not able to respond behaviorally in the way that we would like them to for, for lots of reasons. They're too young, they're prelingual, they don't understand the instructions, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so today, uh, for this lecture, we're gonna be talking about subjective tests, okay? So, um, what we're gonna do for subjective testing is kind of lay out what happens in an audiometric evaluation, okay? These things we do with every single patient. This is sort of the bread and butter for what I do at Montefiore on a daily basis. I bring a patient into a booth, a sound-treated booth. It's a booth that has carpet. It's a booth that has no vents. It has a, usually a window where I'm sitting behind the window and I'm sitting at an audiometer, which is a piece of equipment where I'm able to present and manipulate the buttons to present information to the patient, okay? When we do a complete audiometric evaluation with the patient, we do case history, which we'll get into a second, otoscopy. We do pure tones, both air and bone conduction. We do speech audiometry, which is speech reception threshold and word recognition scores. We also do tympanometry and otoacoustic emissions, but those are objective tests, and we'll get to those in a different lecture, okay? So going down the list, first we start with case history. I'm gonna hit this stuff very briefly, but case history is something that, um, I, I guess I'm gonna get on my soapbox here a little bit. Um, how many of you have ever gone to a doctor's appointment or to a, a specialist appointment, and you've gone online and filled out all the stuff. You get there, you have to fill out a whole bunch of paperwork telling them uh, the, the person why you're there. You maybe you have to tell the receptionist, you know, give them why are you here. The person takes your um, blood pressure and vital signs and you have to say, they say, why are you here? And you have to tell them again. And then the specialist walks in and says, so tell me, why are you here? Don't do this. If I can give you one piece of information about being a good clinician, it is take the time necessary to read the information that the patient has provided for you. Nothing drives me crazier than when I go to a new doctor's office or a new specialist's office and I have spent a significant amount of my time filling out stuff for that person's behalf and then they didn't take the time to read it. Automatically, I know that person really isn't on my side. It's not that they're, you know, an antagonistic, but they haven't really shown me the respect as a patient to take the time to read a little bit about me. So if I can give you one piece of advice, always take the time necessary to read why the person is there. If you're busy, stop, go to the computer, look up the patient's chart, 
see what their medical history is. I tell you what, it makes a world of difference if you come into the appointment and you walk in and say, I understand that you've been having some trouble with your left ear. Tell me about that. And that person, you can see it on their face, big sigh of relief. Oh, this person took the time to know a little bit about me. And if you can get that good sort of patient rapport right there at the beginning, you will get better responses behaviorally from the person because the person sees you as somebody that's on their side, okay? So case history is so important. You need to develop a rapport with the patient right there on the spot and you they'll follow you to the ends of the earth with that. So it's my little soapbox, I'll get off that, okay? Now, after case history, we as audiologists next do otoscopy. Otoscopy is sort of not really a, a test per se, but otoscopy is where we take the pinna and we pull it back and we pull it up for adults. For very, very young children, generally, we pull it back and down. So we pull it superiorly and inferior, or posteriorly and superiorly for adults, posteriorly and inferiorly for children, for young ones, okay? We shine the ot otoscope within there, which is just that light. I wish I had one, but I don't. And we just are taking a look for earwax. We're taking a look for the eardrum to see if the eardrum looks nice and healthy. Foreign objects, all that sort of thing. We need to make sure that we don't have anything in the outer ear. Remember, the outer ear is from the pinna to the eardrum that is blocking um, the ability for sound to go in, okay? After we do otoscopy, we do what is called pure tone audiometry. Okay, now this is where it's at. I'm gonna show you here on the computer. This is the audiogram, as you can see. We start at 1,000, oops, we start at 1,000 hertz with every patient. And if you presume that the patient has normal hearing, you're gonna start at about 30 decibels and you're gonna present a tone. Boop. You're gonna present that tone until the person responds, okay? We, we engage in what's called the staircase method with each patient. At 30 decibels, boop the person raises their hand and responds, okay? I then go down 10 decibels to 20 decibels, boop, the person responds. I go down another 10 decibels, boop, the person responds. I go another 10 decibels down, I'm now at zero decibels at 1000 hertz. That's a very, very soft sound. Boop, the person doesn't respond. Okay, so what I need to then do is go up five decibels to five decibels, boop, the person responds, but barely, they barely hear it. The staircase method is doing kind of a, kind of a honing in on the threshold, if that makes sense. What we're doing is going down 10, going down 10 till they don't respond, and then going up five, okay? Once we get two or three positive responses at whatever the softest level it is, we make a mark on the audiogram, okay? So let me go back to this picture here. When we find whatever the threshold is, for the right ear, we make a circle, and for the left ear, we make an X. We do that for 1,000 hertz. We do that, sorry, we do that for 2,000 hertz, 4,000 hertz, 8,000 hertz, back down to 250, and then 500. Okay, let me say that one more time. We use the staircase method to find the air conduction threshold for 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, 8,000, 250, and 500 hertz, okay? Those six frequencies are the frequencies necessary for speech comprehension, okay? We want to find out if the person can hear sounds at soft levels. So if the person's thresholds, if all of their X's and O's are up here at the top of the graph, that person is said to have normal hearing, okay? If all of their X's and O's are down here at this edge of the, gra edge of the graph, that person is said to have a profound sensory neural hearing loss, which would be in line with somebody being deaf, okay? Now, most people's thresholds, their air conduction thresholds are going to fall somewhere in that graph, okay? We use air conduction to find out the degree of hearing impairment, okay? I'm sorry, I'm holding this a little bit. There we go. So if the person's X's and O's, if their thresholds are above 25, the person has normal hearing. 
if they're somewhere between 25 and 40, the person has a mild hearing loss. If they're between 40 and 55, 60, that person has moderate. Moderately severe is generally 60 to 70. Severe is 70 to 90, and anything above 90 decibels is going to be considered to be a profound hearing loss. Now, remember, a person isn't necessarily going to have thresholds that go straight across, right? This person, in this case, starts off with a mild hearing loss and falls down to moderately severe in the right ear and severe in the left ear. Okay, there are a whole bunch of audiograms that I have put onto Blackboard into, uh, I believe this is in unit two. So you can take a look at those. You have to kind of uh, ignore my chicken scratch writing there. But, you know, if we were teaching this more traditionally, I could certainly take the time to go through them, but you're going to have to kind of go through them on your own. Um, and I'm happy to, to go through any of them individually with you if any of you are having trouble with this. But remember, we are doing air conduction testing by putting headphones on the person's ears. We can even do what's called an insert where we put an insert earphone into the person's ears, but we are testing the entire auditory system with air conduction. Air conduction means we are sending sound through the air. We put the headphone on, air, air molecules within the outer ear vibrate set the eardrum into vibration, the ossicles into vibration, the fluids and the membranes of the inner ear into vibration, causing the uh, cranial nerve number eight to fire and the brainstem and brain to perceive it as sound. The person raises their hand, okay? Air conduction threshold needs to be done for those six frequencies, those octaves of 255, one, two, four, and eight for both the left ear and for the right ear, okay? So if you are guessing that this takes a little bit of time, it does. It gets faster, you know, as you, as you, as you do this and as, as the person is understanding what to do, you can pick up speed. But it can be a little bit tedious. It can be a little bit tedious for the patient and it can be a little bit tedious for the audiologist as well. But it's very important to get it right. Air conduction testing is telling us the degree of hearing loss. In other words, if the person has normal hearing, if they have a mild loss, a moderate loss, moderately severe loss, severe or profound loss. Now, air conduction testing only tells us one thing. Air conduction testing cannot be done alone. We next need to move to bone conduction testing. Okay, now bone conduction testing, we take the headphones off and we put on what's called a bone oscillator onto the person's head. It's done right onto the mastoid. I'm going to see if I can find a picture of it. It's a piece of plastic that essentially sits right behind the ear. I know I have a picture of it here somewhere. There it is. This is a bone oscillator. This slideshow is, is on Blackboard, by the way, but that's a bone oscillator right there. It sits right on that mastoid, that hardest section of the temporal bone right here. And then a piece of metal sits right there. It's very uncomfortable. Patients do not like that, but you know, that's just, those are the breaks. Um, bone conduction does one thing that air conduction does not. Bone conduction is just testing cochlea and beyond, okay? Now, stay with me here for a second because this is one of the most complicated things of audiology and a lot of people do not get this. Even if we were in a more full class and I talked about this for three hours, it can still be a little bit inscrutable for some people. Bone conduction, by putting a piece of plastic right here on the mastoid, I'm eliminating the contribution of the outer ear and the middle ear. I am vibrating the bones of your skull at the frequencies necessary for us to test you at 250, 500, 1,000, 2,000, or 4,000. We don't do 8,000 for bone. The entire skull vibrates, vibrating the fluids of the cochlea, the membranes of the cochlea, and causing cranial nerve number eight to fire and send a signal to the brain. In other words, bone conduction testing eliminates the acoustic and the mechanical part of the auditory transduction process. We put the bone oscillator onto the mastoid and the fluids of the cochlea goes right from hydraulic to electric, okay? 
Bone conduction testing tells us the type of hearing loss, okay? So remember, air conduction testing, where we go through the entire ear, tells us the degree of hearing loss, how poorly the person is hearing. Bone conduction testing tells us if the hearing loss is conductive, sensory neural, or a mixture of the two, okay? Now, why is that? If you think about it, what bone conduction testing is doing is saying, let's just forget about the outer ear and middle ear. Let's see if the person can hear normally when we test by bone. So let's think about this. If we put sounds through air conduction and the person has a mild or moderate hearing loss, but then we test the person's bone conduction and the person is hearing normally, we know that the hearing loss has to be in the outer or middle ear. In other words, when we put sound through the entire auditory system, the person is hearing poorly, but when we put sound through just the inner ear to the central auditory system, the person's hearing normally. We know that the pathology is somewhere in the outer middle ear, meaning that sound cannot get through the outer or middle ear to get to the organ of hearing normally. If we bypass the outer and middle ear, the person here is just fine. The pathology, therefore, this is what's called differential diagnosis. The pathology has to be somewhere in the outer or middle ear. It could be cerumen impaction. It could be otitis media, which is a middle ear infection. It could be um, ossicular chain discontinuity. It could be any number of things, any number of pathologies that befall the outer or middle ear, okay? So if the person has normal bone conduction, but poor air conduction, we have a conductive hearing loss. It's a hearing loss of the conductive system, okay? So, this is a very complicated subject, and I please, please, please email me with your questions if you have them. This is sort of the foundation of audiology, understanding conductive hearing losses versus sensory neural hearing losses versus mixed hearing losses. Now, when we do audiometry, we can come up with one of, I guess, four different results, okay? And remember, we have to do it for both ears, but... We can have air conduction and bone conduction both be normal, both be at the top of the audiogram, which means that the person is hearing normally. We can have bone conduction normal, but air conduction down. Air conduction is poorer than bone, meaning that the person has a conductive hearing loss. We can have bone conduction and air conduction be down, be poor, at equal amounts, which means that the person has a sensory neural hearing loss, or we can have bone conduction be down, be poor, and air conduction be even poorer than that, and that is a mixed hearing loss, okay? So let's do this one more time. Bone and air, both normal, normal hearing. Bone normal, air down, conductive hearing loss. Bone and air down, at equal amounts, sensory neural hearing loss, bone down and air down even farther than that, even poorer than that, mixed hearing loss, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and stop there because we're almost at the 20 minute mark and I don't want these lectures to be longer than that. I do need to do one more lecture on speech and we need to do one more lecture on um, the objective tests that we talked about as well as some other pediatric stuff. Thank you for hanging in there. I want to get this posted right away because I know we're running behind. Some of you have remarked about needing more time for um, the YouTube projects. That is fine with me if you need them, but hopefully you haven't been waiting, um, haven't been uh, not working on these. Uh, most of the stuff for this class is, is project-based. So even though I have not been available the last couple weeks, hopefully you've been working on them. But if you do need more time for the YouTube projects, that's absolutely fine. If you need the, uh, an extra week, that's fine, but just let me know. Otherwise, I'm gonna assume that you'll turn them in at the date that's due on the syllabus. Thank you much, and uh, we'll talk soon.